we built a really strong process in there where we had buy-in from the surgeons first, uh, certainly buy-in from the operating room leadership. But then it placed, I won't say a burden, but a, a huge challenge on the sterile processing department in that we then had to rise to the occasion as well. We had to make sure that when these loaner trays came in our building, they were prepared and the surgeon got exactly what they needed every time they came in. Millions of patients undergo surgical procedures every single day. Working behind the scenes are the technicians who go largely unknown. Even to the patients whose lives are so dramatically impacted by their work. This is Beyond Clean, the global voice of sterile processing. Join us as we explore this hidden world and introduce you to the unsung heroes driving the advancement of our profession. And now, your hosts, Hank Balch, Justin Poulin, and Michael Matthews. Beyond Clean. This week on Beyond Clean, we speak with Bob Mars. Bob has spent the last nine years with Asculap in various educational and consulting roles. Previously, Bob worked in the perioperative setting for 21 years in various roles ranging from certified surgical technologist to CSD technician, case cart coordinator, sterile processing manager, and director. Bob maintains certifications as a CRCST, CIS, CHL, and as an instructor for ISHM. He served as the president of the Texas State Association of Central Service Professionals for six years and is an ISHM executive board member. Bob also served as the co-chair of the ISHM membership committee and is now a member of the orthopedic committee, which he once chaired. Bob holds a bachelor's degree in professional communications from Xavier University in Cincinnati, Ohio. He travels throughout the U.S. and the world speaking about various CSSD and infection control issues. He's published in numerous healthcare periodicals and has contributed to the ISHM CRCST 7th edition and CHL leadership manuals. Bob has a passion for excellence in sterile processing and believes that certification through education provides the foundation needed for superior patient care and also a very special announcement that we have for you this week. I know Isham is right around the corner, and we're just about halfway through season four. But this is a very exciting announcement, and I'm actually going to give it up to Hank to make the announcement and welcome Bob onto the show. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. The big news, the news heard around the globe, is that Bob Mars is the newest partner of Beyond Clean. So, Bob, normally we don't bring the guest into the introduction, but a man who uh, needs no introduction but just got a big one, we're very pleased to have you on. And I think maybe some words from our newest partner to our listening audience is in order before we sort of break off into the interview. So, Bob, I know, uh, I know we've been talking about it for a while, but I'm glad it's finally come to fruition. Justin, Hank, Mike, uh, I, I can't even begin to tell you all how excited I am uh, to join the Beyond Clean team. Uh, it, it's something that I've been looking forward to for quite some time, and uh, I, I've watched the impact that you all have had globally, and just it really uh, spoke to me and desperately wanted to become a part of it, so I'm super excited to, uh, to have the opportunity. Well, we're excited to talk to you today you know, about loaner instrumentation, and that's going to be excellent, but... I think if everybody could just stop by the Isham booth, because Beyond Clean is going to have a booth at Isham this year, it would be really great if many of our dedicated listeners would stop by and congratulate you on your new opportunity for certain. Uh, Mike, I know we haven't heard from you, but maybe some words of welcome for Bob before we break into the advertisements and, and come back for the interview. Guys, I got to tell you, I, I, I remember very clearly – the moment that Hank informed me that we were talking to Bob and Bob wanted to to get on board because I was in the middle of a restaurant at lunch in Augusta, Georgia, uh, in between giving in services. And when I got that text message, uh, I literally cheered in the middle of the restaurant, which made everybody look at me like I was a crazy person. And I, I really didn't that. care. Yeah. <laughs> and I really didn't care because I was so happy that the idea of having Bob on board. So to have him here 
is incredibly exciting and I, there's nothing but a bright future ahead. I'm very, I'm very excited. Well, we're all looking forward to Esham and being able to, uh, to have Bob uh, show face as the newest partner at Beyond Clean. And speaking of, you can subscribe to Beyond Clean on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify, or search for Beyond Clean on your favorite podcast application. We can also be heard on the Sterile Education app, available on iTunes and Android. Don't forget to visit us at the Isham Annual Conference and Expo. You can find us at booth number 256. Six, and we are hosting our second annual myth-busting panel discussion on Monday night. Register now at beyondclean.net as space is limited. You can follow Beyond Clean on Twitter at beyondcleaninfo, facebook.com slash beyondcleanpodcast, linkedin.com slash company slash beyondclean, and our Instagram is beyondcleanpodcast. If you have a recommendation for a future guest or topic, on the show, you can send us an email to info at beyondclean.net. Season four of Beyond Clean is brought to you by Anderson Products and Key Surgical. Superbugs are evolving quickly. Is your infection control keeping up? Introducing the new FDA cleared EO Gas 4, combining the proven reliability of ETO sterilization with a new high efficiency micro dose technology produces zero emissions to the environment and manufactured here in the U.S. with over 5,000 Anderson sterilization systems in use worldwide. Learn more at anpro.com. That's A-N-P-R-O dot com. And Key Surgical, a leading provider of sterile processing, endoscopy, operating room, and instrument care supplies, committed to manufacturing and distributing the highest quality products, Key Surgical maintains the highest level of applicable ISO and FDA requirements. Continual dedication to personalized customer service and an extensive product line allow Key Surgical to serve the needs of hospitals, surgical centers, and more throughout the U.S. and internationally. Go to keysurgical.com to find a wide variety of instrument processing and protection solutions, as well as continuing education courses in sterile processing best practices. We'll be right back after a short break. Beyond Clean. Joining us now, once again, Bob Mars, our newest partner at Beyond Clean. And Bob, so we could take a little bit of the pressure off from the big announcement we can get into content, something that uh, you're an expert in, and we're going to talk about the dirty truth of loner decontamination. And I know loner inventory, boy, this has always been a hot topic at Isham or any of the regional conferences, just in the industry in general. We've already done an episode on uh, loner inventory, uh, vendor-managed inventory, but I think we're going to take a little bit different perspective with you today. And also, I know that you've had one prior appearance on Beyond Clean. So this is actually your your second, although now you're part of the team. So we don't calculate this or tally appearances once you're on the team. But you're right now, in this moment, one of the select few second-time guests on Beyond Clean, although... Uh, you're not going to qualify as a guest much longer. So why don't we get right into it with the dirty truth of loner decontamination, and let's talk about the importance of creating a loner policy uh, in general for just all sterile processing departments because we know one of the big challenges is those loners coming in uh, the same morning as the case. Boy, what a what a difficulty that is. Yeah, it's a huge deal. It, it, it's really interesting that in 2008, I spoke at the ISHA meeting, uh, annual meeting, on the topic of loaner instruments, and then in 2010, wrote an article about the challenges with loaner instruments, and here we are in 2019, and uh, it's still a significant issue most places that I go. And one of the things that I find as I run around is that folks just don't have a, a strong policy in their facility. And without that policy, it makes it very difficult to hold folks accountable, to 
make sure that everybody is on the same page. Whenever you create this policy and procedure, you want to make sure you're developing a partnership between uh, the operating room, between sterile processing, maybe your purchasing department, and, and also your sales representatives, because everybody uh, really have to work together collaboratively to make sure that this whole system functions properly. Yeah, that's a great point, Bob. And the at the point that you made a, a strong loaner policy, when I'm in the field consulting, it's as you said, they either don't have a policy or they have a policy, but it's actually not applicable to sterile processing. It's more of a purchasing uh, policy dealing with implants, payments, et cetera. Or mm-hmm. if there is a policy in place, it is not that fleshed out and it has no teeth. And so if there is a, a non-compliance with the policy, it's just an, oh, well, we tried kind of thing. But, you know, going into our conversation today specific to decontaminating loaners, I was wondering if you could go through a couple of the important policy aspects particular to decontaminating them and try to give our audience a couple of specifics if they do have a policy that they're working through today to make sure to include. Absolutely. If they're looking at the decontamination portion of their policy for loaner trays, uh, certainly would want to start with the pre-cleaning that should be happening in the operating room before these instruments even come down to uh, decontamination. As you know, running around and and visiting departments all over the country, you can go in and see loaner instruments that come down that are just literally caked with bio-burden and body parts and bone and Uh, everything that you can imagine from one of those cases. And as we know, the the cleaning aspect of of the instrumentation is the most important thing. We know that if instruments aren't clean, you can't get them sterile. And when they come down like that, it automatically extends the time that it takes the sterile processing staff to prepare those instruments to get them through. And often people don't realize it, but if you start looking at the IFUs for these instruments, you can easily reach 50 minutes before they even go into the washer. And and this is just for your manual cleaning, your rinsing, placing them in the ultrasonic, and then putting them in the washer decontaminator. So 50 minutes just leading up to getting them into the washer. And if they come down coated and caked with uh, bio burden, it's just going to take the sterile processing staff that much longer to clean them. So that's a huge part of it. Um, the pre-cleaning, the pre-treatment that happens in the operating room. But then at the, at the manual sink, uh, making sure that they've got a three-basin sink where they're, they're soaking the instruments, they're washing the instruments, they're uh, then rinsing the instruments, making sure that they've got the correct dilution ratios in the sink, that the water is at the appropriate temperature according to manufacturer's instruction for use, uh, and ultimately that the, the ultrasonic is set appropriately as well. Um, I think this is another area that folks don't think about often when these machines come to your facility, they come with a manufacturer setting of five or six minutes. And often ultrasonic IFU from X company might say ultrasonic for 10 minutes or 12 minutes or 15 minutes. So people have been running them all this time uh, and they're, they're not hitting the time that's explained in the IFU. Well, and in connection to those IFUs, and of course, Bob, I know you're a, a longtime listener to the show, so you know that uh, you know uh, the difficulties associated with IFUs are something that we have talked about many, many times on this show. I mean, and you've already touched on it a little bit about these equipment considerations. You know, what are all of those equipment considerations that we really have to take into account when we are thinking about processing those loaners? Yeah, I think we can fall into the trap when we say IFU of thinking of instruments only. And when you really get down to the nitty-gritty and decontaminate, you're talking about the IFUs for the chemistries that are going into the sinks, for the temperature that should be maintained, the dilution ratio that should be maintained, then stepping over to the ultrasonic, looking at the IFU again at the dilution and what type of chemistry you're putting in it. Are they degassing the machine daily like they're supposed to? Are they making sure that the machine is functioning the way that it should? Getting to the washer decontaminator, same thing. Are they being tested daily to make sure that they work properly? But are they being dosed properly? Are the pumps running properly? Have they been maintained? Are the sprayer arms getting cleaned on a regular basis? Um, Everything that's involved in making sure that these instruments are being cleaned and also that they're loading them into the washers correctly. Often, I, I find I was in a hospital 
uh, one time where I, I walked up to the washer and thought I was seeing things wrong. But, you know, a, a traditional washer will hold six trays, full size trays. And that's if you don't have to take them apart. And this, on this certain day that I, I went to the department, they had 12 trays in the washer. They'd actually taken the middle rack out that has the sprayer arm on it. So, uh, you know, I asked them, why are they doing that? And they said, well, if we don't do that, the order doesn't get what we, uh, they, they want from us. And I said, well, I would recommend that you don't give it to them because that product is not clean. Um, you could clearly see the way the washer was running, that it was not functioning properly. And, uh, it really makes it a challenge. So IFU certainly is a, a big, big deal. And I know we say that a lot. We hear that term a lot. Often I will ask folks when I go and speak around the country, I'll just say, you know, raise your hand if you follow the IFUs 100% of the time in your department every day. And, you know, people raise their hand and I kind of joke with them and say, ah, you're lying. You can't do it. You know, it's unfortunately, I think we've been set up for failure. When that edict came out that said you have to follow the IFU for every instrument, for every piece of equipment, for everything you have in your department, it, it virtually is impossible for a department to do. Taking the, the middle rack out so you can fit more trays in there, that just sounds like creative efficiency to me. Uh, <laughs> uh, obviously, I'm kidding. But uh, I wanted to ask about uh, deionized water. Are you seeing a lot of you know loaners that are requiring facilities to rinse their instruments or have a final rinse in the automated washers you know, using a deionized water process? I, I do see that. I see either DI or RO water. And, and it's really interesting, you know, in, in the standards and recommended practices, they also want that third basin in your sink to be DI or RO water. And often I find that it's not. I've, I've talked to folks and they said, well, we're, we're getting it in the washers, so we really don't need it in the sink. But I, I disagree. Number one, the standard says that it should, in the third sink, be deionized or a reverse osmosis water. So you're helping get any of those elements off of the instruments before they go into the washer. So then they're getting hit again. And then finally, with that uh, final rinse in the washer, they're getting hit with the DI, deionized water to take any impurities or anything off the instrument before they go into the autoclave and get baked on the instrument. So I have two follows here on that three basin sink topic. It's just one of those uh, areas that there is a lot of debate and or just misconceptions, I guess. But can you describe, so you mentioned, you know, third basin should be DI in there, but what is the first and second basin? What are those supposed to be composed of in that workflow? So the, the first and second typically have normal tap water maintained at a certain temperature, whatever the IFU of the chemistry manufacturer is. So they'll want to have regular water in the first sink, which is where they're soaking the instruments with an enzymatic. In the second sink, they're washing them. This is where they're actually doing the hand washing under the level of the water so they're not creating aerosol. And then finally, that third sink is where they're rinsing everything off, hopefully with the deionized water. And so the second sink then, too, would have enzymatic or it would just be water? Uh, usually an enzymatic in there as well. Yeah. Uh, again, you want to make sure that you're following the manufacturer's IFU, and they're going to tell you in there. They want right. you to soak it a certain way. They want you to wash it a certain way and what type and dilution of chemistry they want you to use, and then finally rinse it. And, um, they, they get pretty specific. And you mentioned, too, in your answer, um, the testing of the equipment. And again, that's one of those things that I think there are some misconceptions or just not standard practice in the frequency that the washers and the ultrasonic units are tested. So could you clarify again what the best practice is for those two units, the washers and the ultrasonics? How often should folks be testing those? Yeah, they used to, uh, in, in the Amy document, they used to recommend uh, weekly, preferably daily, and now it's daily. Um, they want you to test these machines on a daily basis to make sure that they're working from day to day to day, as opposed to maybe if, if you were testing it on Monday and it stopped functioning properly on Wednesday, then Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, you didn't know that you were running a piece of equipment that wasn't running appropriately. So they bumped that up to, to have us test those pieces of equipment every day to make sure that they are functioning properly. Yeah, which makes sense, again, to what you said previously, is if it's not clean, it can't become sterile. So if we're dropping the ball 
on these cleaning cycles, it's a serious issue, and it's one that can't go on for day to day to day to day. It really has to be identified and corrected more quickly. As we flow that in this conversation, you know, Mike talked about uh, the equipment considerations and you reference an experience that I have seen on multiple occasions as well in in the overloading of the washer. And I call that the magic box syndrome, that anything we put in is going to come out the way that it should come out, regardless of how it's loaded. And I think there is some confusion even with the design of the trays. You know, the trays have holes in them. I have heard folks say, well, that's so the water can get in there, the detergent can get in there, and it can be washed even without separating out to those individual layers like you talked about. So with that background, there is a lot of common errors and mistakes and misconceptions related to loaner decontamination. Would you speak to some of those that you've seen in your experience? From my experience and my opinion uh, of running around the country and working in this department and now supervising the department and evaluating departments, I believe the number one reason that we have challenges following the IFU and cleaning and decontaminating these devices appropriately is because of the lack of time allotted between cases. And it starts from when the vendors bring them into the facility and Often, you know, I've been into places and and my last facility was like this where they were bringing multiple trays in the day of surgery. And we wound up becoming a a manufacturing for today's needs rather than thinking about the next day and and just trying to stay alive, turning things over and getting them ready for cases and things like that. So that is one of the biggest ones. And, you know, again, this is one of the things where I'll ask folks, uh, when do they arrive at your facility and are here? Well, we got 30 minutes. We got 45. We got an hour. We got two hours. We got three days. We got two days. We got one day. And kind of go through thinking about it from an auctioneer's perspective when instead of having a policy that says at a minimum, they need to be here 48 hours prior to the procedure and upwards of 72 hours prior to the first procedure. So it's really important that, again, you build that robust policy that outlines exactly when those loaner trays come in, not only having the, the policy, but holding folks accountable to the policy. And, and this can be a challenge. You know, initially when it first happens, the first time that a rep comes in with trays and you look at them and say, hmm, we're not going to use those today. So the first time that you have that conversation, number one, it's very hard because you know you're going to have to go up to the operating room and talk to a surgeon who's anticipating instruments being there for his case. I always tell folks, whenever this happens, you need to accompany as the leader of that department, you need to accompany the sales rep to the OR to speak to the surgeon to say they did not follow our policy and procedure. It specifically says 24 or 48 or 72 hours prior Hopefully it says 72 or at a minimum, minimum 48 hours prior to the procedure. And that way you can say, doctor, we've got a policy. We've got a procedure. This sales representative signed it. They agreed to it and said they would have these instruments here and they chose not to do it for some reason. So I'm sorry, we're not going to be able to do this case today. We cannot have the instruments cleaned and sterilized the way that they should be for your patients who's waiting for this procedure. And Bob, uh, along those lines, I mean, because I've had, a couple of these difficult conversations before, you know, how do you, how do you respond to the rep who, you know, kind of says, you know, 72 hours is completely unreasonable. I, I don't have that many instrument sets. You know, what, what do you expect me to do? You know, what, how do you, what's a gr- good way to respond to that? It's very interesting. When I left my facility here in Texas nine years ago to join ASCAP, I had some, some of the sales reps, the orthopedic sales reps came to my going away uh, reception And uh, one of them said, hey, did you have any idea that, like, for the first six months here, you were the most hated man on the planet? I was like, oh, gosh, thank you. Thank you so much. I love you. They said that because I was very forthcoming with them. When they would tell me that, I would say, it's not my problem. You need to get however many sets you need to have in this city to provide the same standard of care for every patient that comes through our drawers. Ultimately, that's what the Joint Commission is looking for. That's what the DNV is looking for. They want to make sure that we're providing every patient that walks through our doors the same standard of care. And if my first and second case get fully terminally cleaned and disinfected and sterilized and and proper dry time and storage time before they go to the the operating room, 
And then my second two are patients number three and four uh, get them and we're expediting them. We're maybe we're not manually cleaning them the way that they should before they go in the washer, but whatever we're doing to rush them through the process to get them up to the operating room is not acceptable. It, it, it's our responsibility and our position should be to provide every patient that walks through our doors with the same standard of care when it comes to cleaning, disinfection, decontamination, sterilization, storage, and use of these instruments. So, Bob, you know, you've done a nice job. This is how we set up the policy. This is where it should be. Now, Mike asked you, how do we deal with the rep? Now I'm going to say, how do we deal with leadership, especially when you're talking about that rep who has an awesome relationship with one of your most powerful surgeons in the institution, and now all of a sudden that's the one we can make exceptions for, right? How do we reinforce that to leadership? How do we sell that upstream? And I do think – You probably are already teeing up the answer with the whole conversation around the standard of care. If leadership doesn't buy into that, you have different problems, I guess, on your hands to some degree. But it's still, we run into these scenarios at places who still do agree with the standard of care, but they also don't want to disrupt care. You know, the patient was already on the table. They were already getting under anesthesia. You know, there's all these things that kind of come out when, when the arguments happen later. So how do we get that standard of care or how do we sell that to leadership to make sure that we can get back up when we're getting pressure to cut that corner, even though the policy is really nailed down? Yeah, that's a great question. So this is not something that happened overnight in my facility. Um, it, it's something that I actually had to sell. So like you said, um, I went to my uh, OR director and said, hey, here's what I'm thinking. We're getting X number of trays a day. We're having this issue. We're, we're constantly chasing our tail, trying to get stuff turned around. How about we hang a sign that says we're no longer going to accept trays the day of surgery, that they have to be in at, at a minimum, you know, 10 years ago, 24 hours prior to a procedure minimum. Um, we put it into a policy. We talk to the sales representatives, but before we make it official, um, if you agree with me, which my boss at the time, she was very, very supportive and said, amazing idea. Let's, you know, it, it seems like we're having issues every other day with these things. So after she and I agreed on what we were going to do, we then took it to the orthopedic and the neuro committees. And we spoke to the surgeons before we spoke to anybody else. So we told them what we were thinking. And we, we basically said, if you will allow us to do this, Every time you walk through our doors, we will make sure that you have the appropriate instruments, the appropriate implants that you need for a procedure, clean and functional and sterile before every procedure, if you will let us do this. And and the doctors were like, oh, my goodness, if you can really do that. And we said, if we don't do that, you can hold us 100% accountable. So it allowed us to... Uh, then go to the sales reps and say, okay, here's the new change. Uh, here's the document that we need you to sign agreeing to it. And if you choose to go around us and go to the physicians and complain and try to stir things up, we have the opportunity to then call your immediate supervisor and have you removed from the building. We built a really strong process in there where we bought, had buy-in from the surgeons first, uh, certainly buy-in from the operating room leadership. But then it, it placed a, a I won't say a burden, but a, a, a huge challenge on the sterile processing department in that we then had to rise to the occasion as well. We had to make sure that when these loaner trays came in our building, they were prepared and the surgeon got exactly what they needed every time they came in. Well, that's great advice. And speaking of, uh, of advice, I mean, uh, we've already talked about the IFUs and how diverse they can be. And, of course, when you multiply that over how many different vendors – across how many different specialties there are. Obviously, there are a uh, just a ton of different IFUs that are uh, you know necessary for processing these loaners on a regular basis. Do you, can you give us any ideas for how to you know handle all these different diverse and kind of di- diverse IFUs and keep them straight? Yeah, big challenge. E- even bigger challenge knowing that uh, I, I would say roughly 50 to 60 percent of sterile processing departments, uh, do not have a tracking system that they can use in their facility where they've got a computer that's going to allow them to follow the instruments from the beginning to the end. There are a lot of companies out there. First, you're, you're just your generic 
tracking system companies in their systems have a loaner module that you can build into it that will help you track these devices through. They will open up your IFUs. They can look at them and make sure that they're, they have the correct device. They're cleaning it appropriately, taking care of it. And now there have been a lot of other companies that have come onto the market that are for loaner specific so they can track these trays and track only loaner trays and track them to the patient. I, I honestly, I don't know for departments that don't have a tracking system, it, it's virtually impossible. You're then asking someone to maybe uh, have a three ring binder of, of IFUs in the decontamination area, which is just really not not feasible. You know, you've got people in there with wet gloves and every time they reach up and even if they're protected by a, a plastic covering, they're still going to wind up getting ruined and it, it's just not a very good way to, to do it. Uh, ultimately, I always encourage administrators, if you don't have a tracking system, that's one of the things that you really, really need to invest in in your department so you can not only track the devices from beginning to end, but have an opportunity where you can house these IFUs. I know there's a company out there that houses the IFUs, and at, at last check, I believe there are over 100,000 different IFUs in their database. So when you start thinking about that and think about everything that the staff and sterile processing have to know, boy, does it, it, it elevates the, the level of challenge even greater. And you're getting at something, Bob, that's important, again, for the folks in the trenches to hear as basic as it may sound, all of these loaner trays cannot be processed the same way, probably. <laughs> it would have to be an interesting combination of, of different vendors that just happen to have the same instruction, same sonication times, etc. Chances are very, very high that you've got a, a diversity of vendors that's going to require something different. And at the very least, you know, you should try. Like, I totally agree with your point. It's probably impossible unless you have some um, substantial technology backing you up and process, et cetera. But there's a lot of folks out there today that they're not quite aware that there are such differences in these IFUs when it comes to vendors. Like, we're kind of laser focused on our own instruments. We need to know the robotic ones. We need to know all of the all of our power equipment and all the differences there. But then when it comes to these items that we don't own and they're coming in, you know, with tracking paperwork from vendors, there's an assumption sometimes that, well, there's a standard vendor workflow and all of the vendor trays go through that workflow and there you go. But, you know, you bring up the point is that's not compliant if we are checking back with those IFUs. And to that workflow then, as we kind of close out the interview I want to close out on what a compliant process looks like for outgoing loaners. And I guess as you answer that too, what a non-compliant process is for outgoing loaners for sterile processing. So let's start with non-compliant. Non-compliant would be a vendor coming into the sterilization or the decontamination department and carrying trays and saying, hey, I'm in a hurry. Let me help you clean these. That would definitely be on the, the non-compliant side. Or uh, hey, can you just run some water over these, rinse them off real good for me, let them, I got to get them out of the building, we need them over to another hospital. Um, they need to be uh, disinfected like every other piece of equipment that you're sending through your department. So they need to be manually cleaned appropriately and they need to go through your washer disinfectors before they leave the building. And it's really, really important. This is, again, it's another one where you can receive a lot of pressure. There, again, there's not enough trays in town. we got to get them to another facility, so I need you to step on it. it. Again, it needs to be a very well-planned out section in your policy and procedure that says, here's how we're going to clean them, and here's when you can get them back and where you can pick them up at the end of a procedure. But we're not going to cut corners. We're not going to do anything. And, you know, I, I think we've all been in an apartment where a rep has come in and said, hey, uh, these came from another facility. They're clean. You don't need to send them through the washer. Just take them straight up and put them in the autoclave or, or just wrap them and put them in the autoclave. And we all know that's just not, not the case. I, I think it's really important, too, when you think about the IFU piece of it. On top of all the variations of, of cleaning, there are at least 60 vendors out there that still require extended cycle time. So when you're thinking about running a 420 or a 430 cycle uh, on your autoclave, and now you have to start thinking about a 1240 or a 1640 or an 1840 or even a 2040 cycle, 
it really throws a big kink into the process. And, and when you start thinking about how much equipment that you have to process these devices and start multiplying the number of trays coming in by the number of loads you can run a day in, in your washers, for, for example, it, it can really, really put a bind in, into the system and, and cause those backlogs, log jams, whatever you want to call them that you, you see so much of in sterile processing. Well, Bob, this was a fantastic interview, but even more important, what a great announcement. You're on the team. You're with Beyond Clean now, and we couldn't be more excited. Uh, What a great way to kick off the announcement to have you come and talk about loaner inventory and really give uh, managers, especially out there, the tools that they need to implement a proper process. And I couldn't agree with you more. The tracking system is necessary for so many different reasons. It's really uh, should be in this day and age uh, a minimum requirement in any department. So great advice there as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, again, I can't begin to tell you how excited I am to be a part of the Beyond Clean team. And I I just know that we're going to be able to have an impact uh, not only in the U.S., but around the globe. So it's super, super exciting. And I'm just very thankful to you all for allowing me to be a part of the team. Yeah, we definitely did. And everybody, that's Bob Mars, our newest partner at Beyond Clean. The team is growing. And again, we're looking forward to seeing all of you at the Isha Manual Conference and Expo coming right up. Mike, anything to kind of add as we're closing out? I know while we're doing the chat in the background, Bob's giving all these examples of the wrong ways to do things, and I'm watching you and Hank go back and forth about, yeah, I've lived that. Yep, that happened at my facility. Anything to add there? No, I would just say really pay attention to the advice Bob gave specific to winning over your OR staff first before trying to implement something like this. Oftentimes, sterile processing uh, managers will try to sort of bulldoze a policy like this through. And if you don't have that support from the OR staff, if you don't have that support from the administration, you know this will collapse on you in a hurry. So be smart about how you do it. Listen to Bob's advice. That's exactly how you need to do it, or else you know this can fall apart in a hurry. How about you, Hank? Anything to add before we close out the show? Yeah, Justin, I just want to go back to that policy question again. All of this, even if you have good practice, one of the first things I do in my consulting assessments is go back to the policy because if your practice is good today, there's no promises that tomorrow, if there's a new leader, new technicians, any kind of turnover can throw a good practice out of whack. That's where those policies come as the guardrails to really continue good best practice on into the future. And I think Bob gave some terrific examples for how to build strong policies in this particular category. Yeah, that's a great point. Boy, turnover, nothing undoes great work like turnover. So that's a fantastic point. Bob, once again, thank you very much. That's going to do it for this week's show. As a reminder, you can help support us by subscribing to Beyond Clean on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or Spotify. Simply search for Beyond Clean Podcast. We'd certainly appreciate a rating and a review because your feedback is important to the show. And if you have any topics that you'd like us to cover on a future episode, or if you'd like to share a picture anonymously on our Instagram page, just send an email to info at beyondclean.net. On behalf of Hank, Mike, Bob, and myself, Thank you for listening to another edition of Beyond Clean.